Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third in a series of three uh, on-air programs. Um, the first was about getting started with GCP and what you can build quickly. The second was about machine learning uh, and how you can inspire love in your customers. The third is about bringing GCP close to you. My name is Neil Mueller. I work on the geography expansion team of GCP. Hi, I'm Dave Stiver. I'm a PM for our geo expansion efforts. I've been at Google for the last 12 years, really building out the compute storage and networking infrastructure. That's a long but, time, Dave. Yeah, it's part of what we really use to bring GCP to you. Great. Um, let's get started. We've got a bunch of content. Uh, before I get started, I want to tell you that you can leave questions for us anytime up until the, uh, the end of our, of our uh, presentation. We're going to answer all your questions at the very end. Um, we'll get to them for sure. I'll try to get to every single one of them. Uh, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to answer your questions for about 15. OK. Great. Let's get going. So just a little bit of context. Why are we doing this? Why are we putting regions all over the world? There are really three main requirements that we look at for customers. The number one reason is performance. They're looking for low latency applications. So we have to put our infrastructure close to you and close to your customers. The second reason is uh, high availability. They want multiple locations to select from in order for them to, to meet their uh, business continuity needs and build highly available applications. And then the last one is really control. We put these locations in different parts of the world because customers really want control over where they build their applications and where they store their data. It's really important that we bring the product to you, and uh, you as customers get to pick where you want your data to live. OK. So if you look at this infrastructure investment, Google has really been a cloud company for the last decade. But if you think about what cloud is doing, even at Google scale, we made a huge investment in our infrastructure uh, just in the last three years. If you look at just the last three year spend, it's been over $30 billion, which even at Google scale is a pretty large investment. So this isn't something small that we're doing. It's something that's fundamental to the company. As Eric Schmidt said in our last Next uh, in San Francisco last summer, we built a cloud this big so that you don't have to. To give you an idea about how big our cloud looks physically, um, let's bring ourselves to the Netherlands. So uh, Dave and I just launched our new region in the Netherlands last month. Yeah, yeah. just a couple weeks ago. Not long ago. Um, although I didn't get a chance to see this data center, um, I had to share a couple of the pictures with you. Um, to give you an idea, this is our Netherlands data center, which has a variety of Google services, Google Search, um, YouTube, a number of other services, and then a GCP region inside it as well. You can see in the distance some windmills that are used to power this, uh, this region with renewable energy. Security is something we take very seriously. This is what the exterior security looks like. As you can see, the security guard shack is covered with grass, which I thought was particularly beautiful. On the inside, there are different cells of the data center, which separate different cells from each other. We operate the products within Google very separately. Um, you can see we've got a man trap here with an iris scanner and a physical guard shack. Just one note on that, I think, to build on what Neil said is it's important to understand, right, we have data centers all over the world, but we use the same system of physical and logical security in order to make sure that your data stays safe. It looks a little bit different at the data center level, wherever you go in the world, but it's the same model that we use everywhere. Nice. OK, uh, I mentioned something about the environment and how we use renewable energy, uh, how we've reached 100% renewable energy um, to power our data centers globally. Another thing that's kind of interesting, and I'll let you guys in on a little secret, is that when we first built this uh, data center a couple of years ago, we discovered um, from ecologists that we were going to disrupt a bat habitat. Um, so our local site reliability engineers um, and local officials teamed up together to build this thing that we call a bat cave. Uh, this bat cave houses um, a habitat of bats that you can see in the upper left-hand corner of this picture. They're about the size of your finger. Uh, and with the result of this bat cave, their habitat wasn't disrupted, and we were able to build this, uh, this data center. Uh, if the data center filling up is any indication of how much the bats are going to start filling up, we'll soon have to build another bat cave. Yeah. This is a picture of a solar farm very close to the Netherlands data center that uh, produces uh, enough solar energy to power the Netherlands data center. You can see the windmills in the distance, too. A note on energy. Um, not only have we reached 100% renewable energy um, by either consuming renewable energy itself or by buying enough offsets, but we also use less energy in our data centers than the industry average. The industry average PUE, which is a measure of effectiveness, um, how much energy we're consuming versus how much energy we're wasting, the industry average is 1.7. 
Um, Google's, um, across, Google's global average across all of our data centers um, is 1.12. That's much, much less. Uh, two is bad and one is really great. Um, one means that every energy that you're taking in, you're using to power the data center. Two means that for every piece of energy you're taking in, you're wasting an equivalent atom of energy at the same time. So we're 1.12 and the industry average is 1.7. This means that we can build data centers like this that operate at very high performance, but consume appreciably less energy than any other data centers that we've been able to find in the world. There's a, a really interesting parallel there, too, to draw um, between the data center infrastructure and the cloud world. Um, things that are important to Google are being open with our technology. And so when we were doing all that work back in 2008, 2009, in order to improve uh, our data center efficiency, we got done with all that work. And then we published all of that externally. We shared it with the world. We essentially wrote the script or the playbook for how other people could get that kind of data center efficiency. So it's one of the proudest. I was building data center infrastructure at that time. So it's really one of the proudest moments I had that we took all of that IP and made it publicly available to everybody. The corollary really in the cloud world is something like Kubernetes, where we take mm -hmm. a really fundamental core technology and then and open, open source it. it. Yeah, so open source is super critical to us. We're committed to that as a company, both at the data center infrastructure level and at the cloud level. Wow, great. So if we uh, think a little bit about how we layer cloud over the top of all that data center infrastructure, we can talk a couple dimensions. And the first dimension is probably cloud locations. So we have multiple versions of this that you can think of uh, to choose from as a customer. And we'll build from the inside out. So we'll start with zones. You can think of zones as independent failure domains within a region. So they're independent across multiple dimensions of the physical infrastructure. So they have isolation across power, cooling, networking, and probably most imp importantly, the uh, control plane is isolated as well in these zones. So you can choose these individually. And then if you put a couple of zones together, two, usually we have three zones per region. You, you combine a couple of them together, and you get uh, a region. So regions are geographically independent locations. So an example of one of our oldest regions is in Iowa, or we have one in Belgium, or one that we launched uh, last year, Tokyo. Those are all uh, cloud regions that customers can choose. Then beyond that, if you combine multiple regions together, you get what's called a, a multi-region. And that's a product offering we have where you can choose that. And essentially, we combine multiple regions that are geographically um, separate from one another together into a product offering that gives you that level of isolation and higher availability. And then the last one is global. Global is a service that's essentially spread everywhere in the world where Google data center infrastructure lives. So that's something where you don't even have to think about the location. It's just automatically spread everywhere in the world. And I think it's worth maybe uh, walking through a couple examples of uh, not just the locations, but now how do the services deploy on top of those. Does that make sense? Yeah, let's do it. Great. So a couple of the product or service deployment models. I mentioned uh, we have regional offerings. So something like Compute Engine is a regional or zonal product. You can choose a zone in any region around the world. Uh, Compute Engine is sort of fundamental right, to, to infrastructure or GCP. So you can pick in Oregon or Northern Virginia, all of our locations. Another example is our uh, object storage product, uh, Cloud Storage. Has a, it has both a regional and a multi-regional offering. So you can choose uh, today a bucket in the Americas or in Europe or in Asia. Uh, and when you upload your data, we will automatically replicate that data uh, to those different uh, regions for that multi-regional offering to give you the, the higher availability. And then the last offering is global. Uh, we have a product like PubSub, our messaging service, which is inherently uh, everywhere in the world. So that data and those messages get spread um, everywhere where we have infrastructure and have PubSub running, depending on uh, where your customers are. Good. Three different offerings. So let's talk about a tool that customers can use if they've got questions. Yeah, don't take it from me. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave the slides and we'll go to the actual internet. Now, we're going to navigate to a website that's visible to all you guys. It's cloud.google.com slash about slash locations. The top of the website looks like this. But if you scroll down past the map, you're going to see what Dave and I call the matrix. So let's walk through the matrix. Yeah, so we have it broken up by each market. Today, it's the Americas, it's Europe, and, and Asia Pacific. As we continue to add regions, we'll add more uh, continents, probably. But let's look at two services, just so you can quickly get an example. Each column is a region, and then each row is a service. So Compute Engine, as I mentioned, is kind of a fundamental core product in GCP. Today, it's already available in every single region in GCP. And that's sort of the goal. That's where we want to get, where as much of GCP is available in every single region 
uh, that we launched that we have available today. If you drop down and look at uh, in storage, uh, see something like Cloud Bigtable, super, uh, super uh, popular product, newer than Compute Engine. It's actually trailing a little bit behind. Like we we launch regions faster than we could keep services uh, growing. But as you pace through, if you look through the different markets, you see that. Uh, over the course of this year, Bigtable will start to show up in more and more um, locations. It's super important that you know that we're bringing all of GCP to you in each one of these locations. So we're working through our product list, prioritizing and regionalizing as much of GCP as we can as quickly as possible to make sure that every region you pick is a consistent user experience. We do these kind of presentations in front of customers a lot, and when we do them, we invent words. Supular is not my most <laughs> favorite invented word. Yeah, we'll put that one in the book. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, we'll scroll down here just so the folks can see. Uh, as you can see, uh, all of our products are here listed, um, and you can tell where they are just by looking at the matrix. OK, back to the slides. I'll let you take this one. Nice. OK, so we've talked about the 15 regions where we serve. Uh, uh, GCP customers. Um, you can think of these into three big buckets, uh, Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific. On the x-axis here, we have all of these 15 regions, starting with Iowa and ending all the way over here with Sydney. On the y-axis, we have how much this costs um, for cores. Now, you could do this for storage or for big data or for machine learning or networking. Um, it would follow a very similar trend line. Um, what you're seeing here is that the cost of providing GCP services um, to you in the Americas is a little bit less than in Europe and a little bit less in Asia Pacific. Um, this is true across all of the cloud providers and also within, within Google. Why is that, Dave? So the co part of it is just the cost of doing business varies. Like the cost of energy is different in each one of these locations or the cost of land. Part of it is the age of the facility. So their efficiencies that you get, the longer that facility is up and running. And the last one is just economies as scale. So you can see here, if you look at the oldest regions are the largest regions. And as we grow, we get and more and more customers. We get economies in scale. And that allows us to drop prices. Mm -hmm. So what you can see here is as a GCP customer, you can pick wherever you want to run workloads. If you want the workload to be very close to you, um, you're going to benefit from the speed of light benefits of it being very nearby you. Um, if you're willing to let it be a little bit further away, you can go for, you're now empowered with the information and to know where to buy that for the least, uh, least, least amount of money. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a bit about pricing um, as compared to other cloud providers as long as we're talking about us. So we have a number of, uh, of, of pricing philosophies within GCP that are very advantageous to customers. We call it pr um, customer friendly pricing. One of them is called sustained use discounts, which I've abbreviated in the slide SUD. Now, what sustained use discount says is if you're going to use a piece of compute for 25% or more of the month, you are uh, granted a discount. This is just automatic. You don't have to apply for it or send any emails, make any phone calls. You just get it on your bill. Um, if you use it for the entirety of the month, um, you can get up to a 30% uh, discount. So think if you use it for 30 days, you get a 30% discount. It's a nice, nice easy mnemonic. Um, so you can see our list prices are listed here in the height of the blue bar. If you subtract from that 30%, you will see the SUD price, sustained use discount. Now, just as a comparison, I've posted what um, Amazon's price was as of a couple of days ago when I made this slide. And you can see what it is right here. So you can see that um, the general um, uh, price increases from Americas to Europe and Asia um, is also with Amazon. Um, and in general, we are much, much less. Um, when you uh, account for sustained use discount, we are appreciably less. Um, than other public cloud providers, including Amazon. OK. So uh, just to give a little bit of context to how we've grown, uh, if you look back, I think 18 months, we had four regions uh, uh, around the world. And today, we have 15. Um, so that's like 300% growth in, in the last 18 months, which even at Google scale is significant. Uh, you can see all of our uh, launch regions here in the map are in blue. And then we have four new regions that we've already announced that are coming. So Finland, Los Angeles, uh, Osaka, which is our second region in uh, Japan. We just announced that one, which is important uh, for DR in Japan. And then Hong Kong are all coming in 2018. Uh, there are additional regions coming as well. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. But we have many more in the pipeline. This is just what we've announced so far. Nice. Um, the next website that we'd like to show you, in addition to these slides, 
is uh, like a tool that you all can use. It's called gcping.com. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you guys can read it. So this is a website that shows you which region might be best for you. Now, you might pick best based on cost, but you might pick best based on speed. And all the advancements that Google does around our network, we still can't adjust the speed of light. It is what it is. And so the physically closest region to you is going to be the fastest response time. And this tool is a way for you to figure that out. So let's, let's do a race. Let's click here. And we'll figure out which is the closest region to us. I'm guessing it's going to be Oregon. Um, the one after that is going to be Iowa, where I was born. And then as we move eastward, it'll be to northern Virginia and then Montreal. What's the farthest region from us? Uh, it's Mumbai, 304 milliseconds. Still not bad, even though it's on the other side of the world. Yeah. Interesting to note that uh, this test goes over the public circuits. If you were using the Google's private network, which we'll tell you about in a second, um, it would be less than that, um, up to half um, the, the latency, so 150 milliseconds to Mumbai. OK, back to slides. There, GCP. Yep. Um, just to give you a little bit of context visually for how we, um, this, what this launch velocity looks like, um, one of the things that we decided maybe two years ago was we just weren't keeping face keeping pace with uh, the speed of our customers and what they needed for us. So we spent almost a year really building out a, a set of automation tools to allow us to quickly uh, turn up a new region. So everything in our stack, from the lowest level of infrastructure, right, every DIM, every server, every rack, all the way up to the top of the stack, uh, our managed services offering, have all been automated so that we can stand up a set of uh, a new zones and a region uh, in a relatively short amount of time. So you can see sort of what our launch velocity looked like there in, in 2015 and 2016, what we've been up to in 2017, um, and then what we have in store in 2018. So your automation is why you were able to tumble them out so quick in 2017. Yeah, without that, we never would have been able to do this. We'd be talking about uh, seven or eight or 10 regions, not 15. And from what I'm hearing from you, it's probably going to just continue. Correct. OK, good. Yep. Yeah, it's worth, uh, for each one of those new region launches, I mentioned uh, you know, we're trying to put every service in all locations. But right now, this is sort of the standard offering that we have. And it cuts across all the dimensions of, of GCP, whether it's compute, storage, big data, networking, or our IAM services. It's something that we put into every location. I did highlight a few services because we just finished uh, the work on those. Cloud Spanner and Cloud Bigtable will now be a part of every new region launch going forward, so you won't have to wait for that. Cloud BigQuery has extensive plans to roll out to more locations in 2018, and we'll get them caught up shortly. So that critical sort of uh, key feature of GCP, uh, Cloud BigQuery, will be available everywhere for you. You're going to put Spanner, Bigtable, and BigQuery in every single new region. That's what we said uh, 18 months ago. How would we possibly do that? That automation is the way that we ah, get there. So we could expect Hong Kong, Osaka, Finland, LA, all of them will have those three that you bolded there. Absolutely. Fantastic. You want me to take this? You can start. I'll finish. OK. Uh, so we talk a lot about regions. We talk a lot about services. But one of the things we don't sometimes, I think, talk about enough is the investment that we've made in uh, our network infrastructure. We've been building out this global network for over the last 15 years, really. And it's kind of the secret sauce of Google. We had an expression uh, a decade ago almost now that said, it's all about the network. And it really is. It's the tie that binds. So you take this uh, network infrastructure investment, combine it with all the regions, combine it with the edge caches and the points of presence that we have. And it really <coughs> becomes this sort of global scale computer that you can program on top, on top of. It's what of all of our engineers here at Google program on top of. It's what they've become accustomed to. Be careful once you get used to how fast it is. You talked about you know, how much better the latency is. Be careful once you get used to how fast it is. It's hard to go back to the, yeah. to the public internet. But this is really uh, a significant part of that infrastructure investment. The only thing I would add is if you've ever used Google.com and the brilliance of search, uh, you have experienced this network. It's the distributed computing problem that Google solved long before I joined Google um, was solved with a network like this. Um, and it'll, it'll empower your business to solve incredibly delightful and joyous uh, user experiences like we've done with Google.com. OK. Uh, what's the expression? The expression is uh, politics is local. 
Yeah. So all politics is local, all energy is local, I like to say that. All cloud is really local too. So yeah. these region launches are not just about putting data centers in places, they're really about us bringing GCP and meeting customers where they're at. So this is, we've been out uh, launching these regions for the last 18 months, going to different locations, and it's more than just a data center, it's, it's a lot more than that in terms of opening up a new market. Yeah, it's about um, helping local customers with local salespeople and local tech support people um, and engaging local engineers because Google has engineers all, all over the world. Um, to give you a flavor for this, we've got two animated GIFs and one photo. Uh, so let's just start with uh, the one on the left. Okay, so the one on the left is about our German region launch, which happened um, right around Oktoberfest of last year. Uh, it was incredible. On the left in that picture, you see Urs Hotzel, who is Google's first vice president. He's been at Google a long time, mm -hmm. um, 16, 18 years, long time. He's heavily engaged with the geographic expansion of GCP. Um, on his left is Michael Korbacher, who is in charge of the customer team in Germany um, and uh, Austria and Switzerland. And they're there pressing a buzzer in front of an audience of 300 customers um, as they open the first region um, in Germany. Um, it was really exciting. In the middle, um, we've got someone that I recognize. Uh, Dave Stiver is, is there pressing the button with our head of European customer team, PH. Um, so he and PH are opening up the first region in the Netherlands. That was just a couple weeks ago. Yep. On the right-hand side is really what we want to do for every region launch. Um, you see on the right side of the picture, you see uh, two members of our product team, Maya and Miles Ward. Um, to Miles' right, you see Chris Clayco, who's in charge of North American um, customer team. In the middle, you have the mayor of Montreal. Uh, because building regions has a lot to do with the entire region, uh, not just about the, the data center that's there. Um, to the mayor's right, we've got two of our bigger customers. And then to their right is our country head of Canada um, for Google Cloud. So we take opening up these new regions very seriously. It's more than just a rack of compute. It's about um, rooms and rooms and rooms of people that are there to help you with your problems, um, to help sell you cloud, and to help you solve, um, um, solve your problems. I don't want to set the wrong expectation, but just, you know, in 2017, we launched almost one region a month, 10 new regions in 2017. We didn't quite get to one a month, but we almost got there. So far in 2018, we're almost already doing two a month. So the, the <laughs> Netherlands and Montreal launched, you know, within a day of one another. So we're setting a high bar already in the first month of, of 2018. I don't know if we can keep up, but we'll try. It's fun to work on. Yeah. So, Let's talk about where we're going to build next. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned this at the beginning of the, the discussion. Uh, we're not done yet. Uh, we're thinking about lots of locations. If you look at the a map of the world, which I stare at all the time, uh, I spend 50% of my time really talking to customers in different parts of the world, trying to figure out what they need, and then the other 50% figuring out how do we do the launch in this particular location. So um, we would love to hear from you. Here's some spots that we're already in and then some spots that we're thinking about landing. You can expect to see additional locations and markets we've already gone to, like we launched Osaka, uh, Osaka in Japan. So Alaska, Hawaii, that's just because we highlighted America, right? Correct. Okay, Correct. got it. Yep. Uh, and the, with the Montreal launch, we now have Canada. But there are other parts of the world that still need GCP. And so uh, my ask to you is uh, take a look at that link. Um, oh, yeah, bit.ly slash GCP regions. It's yeah. a Google form that you can fill out and it comes right to Dave and I and you can tell us what you think. Yeah, tell us where you want us uh, to go and tell us what we should bring when we get there. Oh yeah, so where do we want to open a region? Where do they want us to open a region and what services do we do they want us to put there? Absolutely. Knowing that Spanner and Bigtable and the other one is going to I'll be there. Big query. Big query. Thank you. Those Already three. coming, but there are a lot of services in GCP. It's a big stack, so I could always use help from folks prioritizing what should come next. Nice. Okay. That is the last slide. We are now ready to answer questions. Perfect. Um, stay tuned for the live Q&A. It'll begin in about one minute.
Okay, we got our Here questions. Go. Uh, do you want me to dive in first? How about I read them and you answer them? Even better. <laughs> uh, questions from the audience. Thank you so much for leaving questions. If you don't see your question um, answered by us now, um, you can go ahead and tweet either one of us on Twitter, or you can go and fill out that um, bit.ly slash GCP regions. Um, there's probably a, a thing at the bottom that says leave a note. That note will come directly to us, so easy to get a hold of us. Uh, okay, first question. How many total regions are you planning on building? 32. Uh, 40, 42 is the answer, right? Hitchhiker's no, no. Guide to the Galaxy? Yes. Uh, <laughs> No, the, the actual, I get this question a lot even internally at Google, like when do we stop? Um, the answer is when, qu when customers really stop asking us for new regions, uh, we look, and this is combined with that second question as well, is how do you choose where to build regions? Uh -huh. So it's all based on customer demand. We look at the attributes that customers want from us, whether it's latency, whether it's uh, where they can store their data, mm. uh, how many locations do they need to meet their availability guidelines, which varies by industry, right? We have a lot of customers that we've already onboarded onto cloud, but we know it's not an easy journey, particularly if you're a, in an industry that has a lot of regulatory requirements that you need to work around. That's why we're bringing these regions to you to meet you where you're at geographically and also in the state that you're in. And so to answer the first question, we don't have a number. We'll build until customers tell us to stop. Nice, that's good. Yeah, if, if we're putting numbers on, I think we'll build less than 100. Yeah, that makes sense. We have 100 points of presence around the world. So in the expanse of time, we could imagine having a region on top of each one of those. But I imagine over time, those get reshifted around as customers demand them in different locations. So yeah, Yep, and makes the, sense. the definition of locations will also continue to grow as well, I think. We'll get closer and closer to customers. As we've discovered how important latency is in a lot of the applications that we build, I think the market will start to understand and have a better appreciation for how important that is and be able yeah. to pick what parts of their applications need to be super close to customers and which ones don't. The definition of region might change too. Absolutely. Might get closer and closer to customers. Yep. Okay, question number two. How do you choose where to build regions? That one I covered. Yep. Right. We pick it all based on customer demand. So it's constantly out talking to the market, figuring out what they need, and then prioritizing really based <coughs> on the needs of our customers. Um, we have a huge customer base all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our um, customers are global enterprises. So we find their needs are expansive all over the world. So they're looking for us to do that work, to all the data center work, um, in order to give them that single GCP API mm -hmm. everywhere. So I guess the answer to that question is bit.ly slash GCP regions. Yep. Fill out the form, Dave and I find out. Yep. Question number three, what changed in your building strategy to enable you to launch regions faster? Yeah. Automation. Yeah, that's a great question. Automation is, is the first part. Can you dig part. into like one element that I might not have expected is included within automation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, there are actually two answers to this question. The first part is automation. And it's so getting repeatability. So we want to stamp these things out and get the same footprint everywhere um, so that we're not re-engineering our architecture. So we use the same architecture everywhere. That's key. Homogeneity. Yep. Um, the second piece is um, we actually had to change the way we did data center infrastructure because mm -hmm. you know, we have a hu several huge 1 billion customer um, applications inside of Google, right? Search. Yeah ads, Gmail, these are huge services inside of Google that are all cloud customers. They're all built on Google's data center infrastructure, right? Not every customer that we have in public cloud is that size. Mm -hmm. And so we had to really look at how do we tailor Google down to the needs of our customers and really shrink it so we could quickly bring the technologies that they were interested to market Huh. and then build out gradually. And that's one of the key differences as well. If we had to bring all of Google Right, that every part, if you need to, to run search to, to a, a every region, service, for yes, example, it would take much longer to do this. So, we really pared that down and developed something that was specific to cloud. It doesn't forget any of the pieces that, that GCP uh, needs, but it was tailored uniquely for cloud. It's a kind of investment in something uh, specific to a, a particular PA in Google that I haven't seen before. So, and that's maybe why every region to begin with doesn't have every single service. Absolutely, we're, we're catering to the customers that have demanded which services. Which is why it's so important that customers go to bit.ly slash GCP regions and tell us what they want. Please. Number four. Um, is there an equivalent to GCPing for competitors' data centers? Uh, 
Yeah, there's <laughs> one for Azure, but I don't know that there's one for Amazon. Um, I also haven't seen one for any of the other public clouds. If you find me on Twitter um, and ask me this question, I will try to find out your answer. I think it's an interesting question. I would love to see one that showed all of the public clouds. Um, here's why that would be interesting. That would be interesting because you'd be able to see at your spot in my home state of Minnesota, which is the closest cloud region to me physically. That might be interesting. It wouldn't be interesting because it wouldn't take account of going over um, private networks. For example, if you were using our private network, GCP is the largest um, private network in the world. You have access to it every time you use GCP. You don't have access to it if you're not using GCP. And so not always does proximity in terms of pings over public transport equate to alacrity of actual experience with cloud. See what I mean? It's more complicated. You might want to actually like boot up a workload in each of those clouds and then do it and then go over the private. It'd be like more complicated. But yeah, tweet me. I'll find you an answer. Number five, what are the metrics or features that determine a region? And who are the people that are involved in this process? Yeah, well, we have, a, um, I guess if you think about what it is we use to decide whether we go, what triggers, I think is the question here, what triggers a new region? Sure. Um, for us, it's about yeah, uh, product market fit. So I have uh, a product that I can take to market today. I have a, a new region and that set of products that I'm launching with today. And we make a minimum infrastructure investment. So we have to see that there's demand in the market for that kind of investment. And so we bring together our sales team that's out working with customers to assess their demand in that location. We're talking for new customers. We're talking a lot to our existing customers, these global multinationals who are looking to spread their infrastructure uh, or their applications around the world. And then we have all the internal stakeholders. Um, we actually have a number of internal services at, at Google mm -hmm. who want to get to these new regions uh, as quickly as they can as well. So we balance the needs of all of those stakeholders. It's not just our public customers, but there are a lot of internal. I get uh, emails every day from Google engineers and different services who want access to these new uh, new regions. Because they want to use computer storage or Bigtable or Spanner that is available publicly to everybody else, but they want to use it for some of our internal products. Correctly. Correct. Wow, that's great. Yeah. G on G. Yes, G on G. Nice. Those are the five questions. Uh, thank you all so much for the time. Um, this was the third of three webinars. We do these webinars every single Tuesday, and they keep getting bigger and better and more interesting. Um, so tune in next Tuesday and learn more about what's hot and new on GCP. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. See you at the next region launch. See you at the next region launch. See you, Dave.